Psychology Wizard. Badly and Hitch 1974. Working Memory Applied. Working Memory, let me remind you, is a theory uh, pertaining to the short-term memory processes developed by Badley and Hitch in 1974. We're going to be looking at how the theory of working memory can be applied to real-life situations, but first let's have a recap of working memory itself. Working memory involves the idea of a central executive, a part of your mind that oversees the memory processes while not itself um, doing any remembering. It's responsible for two and later three slave systems. One of these is the visuospatial sketch pad that deals with visual memories. Another is the phonological loop that deals with acoustic or sound-based memories. And a third, introduced by Badley in the year 2000, is the episodic buffer, which seems to blend together the visual and the acoustic elements into a memory episode, which is then stored in long-term memory. So, the exam board will expect students to be able to follow the instructions for assessment objective 2, which is apply psychological ideas to real-life situations. The main question we have here is, how does working memory explain forgetting? Imagine, in the exam, if you were to get a question where a fictional character forgets some important piece of information, and the examiner might ask you to explain why this has happened using the ideas of working memory. Now, the first thing you want to be able to do is break working memory down into its components. Is there a problem with the visuospatial sketch pad? Or is the phonological loop at fault? Possibly there's some error going on in the episodic buffer. Or the blame could lie with the boss. The central executive overseeing the whole process might be faulty. Let's look at how the slave systems could misfunction uh, by examining the cocktail party effect. This is a well-known problem when people are presented with two sets of information that they have to attend to at once. The mind's capabilities are rather overwhelmed by this and people end up forgetting most of the information they were presented with. This often involves a problem with the phonological loop because in a classic cocktail party the information you're getting is people's voices coming into your ears from both sides and you can attend to one voice or attend to the other voice but when you are trying to attend to both the phonological loop is overwhelmed. We can look at a bit more detail at the phonological loop and try and identify where the problem is. Of course you have a phonological store, a kind of warehouse where recent acoustic memories are kept until you need them. And obviously this has got a finite capacity. If too much information goes in it becomes full and additional information is simply lost. You also have an articulatory process, sometimes called an articulatory loop. This is where you rehearse acoustic information back to yourself, saying it over and over in your mind. Uh, the technical term for that is sub-vocalizing. We're quite familiar with problems like this, where you may be trying to remember a telephone number, and a friend comes up to you and suddenly starts asking you about the score in a football match. Was it 3-2, or 2-3, or 3-1? And in the midst of all of these numbers, you've now forgotten the telephone number. This is because the articulatory process was disrupted by the new numbers you had to attend to. Now, cocktail parties usually involve acoustic information, but the visuospatial sketch pad can have the same problems. Think about the act of driving a car. So much visual information here. You've got information coming through the windscreen, and through the side windows. Then there's the rear view mirrors and the dashboard as well. Any of you who are just learning to drive at the moment will be familiar with how confusing this can be. This is an example of information overwhelming the visuospatial sketch pad. Again, the sketch pad has got a limited capacity. Once it's full, additional information is simply lost and not remembered. However, we do get better at driving 
and we can even get better at hosting cocktail parties. And this is because the mind makes use of a psychological technique known as chunking. Chunking involves grouping together individual bits of information into one larger whole. Then the working memory treats each chunk as if it was a bit of information and can handle more things at the same time. Think about a video game which you play where there's so much visual information on display there, um, the attributes of different characters and your ammo and options to change weapon, and there may be acoustic information coming in as well in terms of side effects and instructions and approaching bosses. When you first play a video game, you find this information overwhelming, but with practice you learn to chunk it, to take in the health of your enemies or comrades at a glance, to take in the weapons that are available to you at another glance, and so the visual spatial sketch pad will treat each of these sets of information as a single chunk. This massively increases how much information the sketch pad can process. There will be quite a few jobs where people benefit from this. For example, uh, working on the floor of the stock exchange, buying and selling, having to take in information of computer monitors, and also the cries of buy and sell from the other traders. Or, for example, bar staff in a busy bar, having to look across the bar at a sea of faces, listen to the orders that they're putting in, visual and acoustic information, but when you learn to chunk, orders and the visual information together, then working memory is less likely to be overwhelmed. And finally, a waitress who not only has to listen to the order that's been given to her, which can be quite complicated and goes into the phonological loop, but has to look around the room and notice spilled drinks and other customers waiting to be served and new customers entering, and that's visual information going to the visuospatial sketch pad. With practice, you can chunk this information, and working memory won't be overwhelmed by it. Another topic that students may want to apply working memory to is dementia, and indeed some students will be looking at this as part of the key question in cognitive psychology. Dementia is a tragic illness involving the gradual loss of cognitive faculties, mostly in older age. Whereas the previous applications we've uh, examined have looked at the slave systems, dementia seems to be a problem with the central executive as well, which loses its ability to manage working memory effectively. It may also be a problem with the episodic buffer, which is a vital link between working memory and long-term memory. One therapy often used with dementia patients is cognitive stimulation. Cognitive stimulation may involve looking at pictures or listening to music from the past that jogs memory. It may involve stimulating activities like jigsaws or, or bingo to get the mind working a little bit harder. And one particular charming example which uh, is featured in a video on the uh, key question page on Psychology Wizard is a project that introduces kindergarten children to a retirement home in America and brings about great improvements in the lives of the dementia sufferers. All of these techniques involve strengthening the link between the central executive and the episodic buffer, enabling dementia sufferers to create new episodes of memory out of their experiences and also to retrieve episodes of memory from long-term memory that will help them make sense of their surroundings. So, I hope you've found that interesting. It's uh, Working Memory, Badly and Hitch, 1974, applied to real-life situations like forgetting and to the case of dementia. There'll be another video on Working Memory in which we look at AO3 Evaluation and Analysis.